I have an idea on how to solve the financial problems of the healthcare industry. Levy a 30% surcharge on every healthcare conference. <laughs> it may work, it may not, but what we are doing now doesn't work, so the downside is not that large. <laughs> we have been, I say we in an editorial sense, you have been, and your colleagues have been working very hard to come up with applications of technology in medicine. The best study or studies on the subject, which basically consisted of wise men sitting around, and maybe a few wise women sitting around the table and making wild mm, guesses is that 50% of the increase in healthcare costs is due to medical technology, good, bad, or indifferent, that we have marketed, developed, and helped people apply. The healthcare industry is pushing on $2 trillion in the US. It is in an unsustainable, it's, it's too weak a word, a state. And people are starting to recognize it. And the one that is most ironic is you may have seen in the New York Times a report on the Massachusetts legislation putting a cap I don't know exactly how they defined what they are putting a cap on, but it's intended to be a cap on medical technology spending in order to combat the runaway spending. There are, this is the time where I would go into finger pointing. NIH, my last finger is tired, FDA, my two fingers are tired to talk about that. I don't think they caused the problem. They made it worse. And I want to put in a new culprit that is medical education. And before you see what I have to show, let me tell you the background. A good friend of mine teaches in one of the major medical centers in California, told me a story of what happened when he got on the subject of decision making with a seminar of residents ready to be put and foisted upon the common folks. I could only represent this to you by having some of you recruited as thespians and enact what happened at this point in this instruction. So let's see that. Usually the ranking by price among drugs is similar. It ranges from old, generic drugs costing less than a dollar a dose to new, highly marketed ones costing up to $60 or even more. Given such variations, should we consider or ignore the cost of these drugs when we prescribe them? No, 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 no. no. What makes you take this position and why are you so convinced about it? Because the new drugs have fewer side effects. There's no question. It seems the newer the better. What if I told you that the old drug, the less expensive drug, has 20% fewer side effects? What then? It may not matter because the new drug's marketing literature says that it has better efficacy. And meanwhile, we could run the new drug through more trials to see if it really has more side effects. 
Let me make sure I understand you. In the face of no evidence, you want to prescribe the more expensive drug. Are you not causing harm to the system? Our duty is to provide the best care and not be worried about controlling costs. To do otherwise would be unethical. You realize that some of the actors really got into their roles. Um, as I was fuming about this, somebody handed me a copy of the New York Times that states it absolutely matter of fact of what we have just seen. And the last, that's the doctor's contribution, and I want to give you the usual assurances, not all doctors, not equal, oversimplification and all that stuff. But one of these is too many. When we go on a little further and look at the patients, the patients have another problem. They are absolutely lost in the labyrinth of medical information, not stuff that they can look up on a website, not about symptoms, treatments, about their bills. If I was mumbling to myself, if every doctor who is a patient was supposed to put together his treatment from a financial standpoint and compared the activity that that, that took with what it would have taken him or her to buy a car, the results would be stunning. And a car is not simple. It had many components, many revisions, and somehow or, another, somehow or other, the automobile industry put a useful parameter in front of us called the MSRP. Interesting about the MSRP history, it goes back to 1958. A senator Monroney, who I have no idea which state he was from, was so pissed at his car dealer for showering at him confusing and unverifiable information that he moved to establish this bill. And like all governmental bills, it has gone on to a continued prosperous life and embraced various requirements of society like environmental conditions, and it has done just fine and provided a fairly predictable cost structure that is a straight line that we plot against uh, the manufacturers' uh, retail price, and since I'm in the process of buying a car, I was looking at and all of a sudden the thought occurred to me, why can't we do that with medical information? Why can't we put together uh, medical suggested retail price which tells what the patient is supposed to pay before the treatment starts, puts all the caveats we may find additional problems on it, and this becomes the basis for the payment. A basic that we have to understand and 
there is a minor understanding in the press of this is what we bill and what the patient actually ends up paying along with his insurance payment are two different things. And the correspondence between them is resolved by long, mysterious negotiations between members of the three groups that participate in setting and steering healthcare economics. Uh, if we set that aside, we look at the medical SRP for a number of procedures, doctor's visit, imaging, first thing you find is you don't get data. What you see there is my data. I know what was done. I constructed this graph for myself. I couldn't construct it for any of you because it is a trade secret between uh, governing the relationship between you and your insurance company. I like ending a little talk like this with a sketch of what we need to do. And what we need to do is mimic the manufacturing industries and particularly the car industry in shaping its responsiveness to insight from, us, from other agencies. That mimicking comes from cost analysis, which is almost never taught in medical school, a willingness to approximate so that you can make future estimates in a standard fashion, also not a practice, people who are much more versed in FX sizes and cohorts than engineering approximation. But most importantly, you have to have facts and not only facts, but all the facts, proprietary information or not. The best way to get all this comes from looking at past data and analyzing it with modern tools so you can not only establish what happened, but establish what happened in the context that prevailed at that time. Data mining, I just found out from a colleague, is extremely expensive. People without blushing give you bills for $99,000 for three months of use of database. As I mentioned, that's not the only obstacle. The New York Times quote a representative of a major healthcare company that's saying the company has successfully used confidentiality to withhold the information. I would feel a little better if I was a little sheepish about it. You take this, and I'm an engineer. I learned fact approximation, estimates, engineering estimates. But particularly I learned that if I don't understand what is happening, I cannot make it better. This is the message that comes from generations of engineers who have tried to roll up their sleeves and show all of you and all of us, what can be done. 
But the significance of doing what I suggested is actually different. I don't know how well members of this audience are educated in competition theory, as in Michael Porter, hands up, please. That is unbelievably terrible. You cannot understand the behavior of businesses without understanding the rudiments of what we have surmised businesses to do to have a fair chance or continue going and to get an unfair chance. That's how competition theory is how monopolies are created. That is how platforms are created, all the buzzwords that you use. In competition theory, the most important relationship is the balance of forces between two key players. The two, the two key players that you have here are the patient and the medical institutions. Simplifying so that the patient can increase their activity, even an iota, multiplied by their numbers will shift the competitive balance between those. And I will tell you this, there is zero chance of making significant change on the subject without changing the competitive balance. So the simple request, call for action, call to get on the mounds of concrete and shout, job one is to free our data. 